everybody. My name is Kara Moncrief, and I am the Clinical Communications Director for Viora. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I think today is going to be fun, uh, Skin 101. So I know, you know, a lot of people that, that get into the industry, get into the field that maybe, you know, came from working in hospitals and, you know, maybe they were a nurse there and, you know, didn't really have um, a ton of knowledge on, on the skin in general. Um, you know, our dental accounts, you know, really doing something very different, and very new. So I figured that this would be something that could be very beneficial, just really understanding the skin, what um, each layer houses and the functions of what it houses. And um, I think when you really have a good understanding of that, then you can really understand how the technologies pair really well with one another, what combination treatments you can do, um, why just one thing isn't gonna fix it all, and why it's so important to do combinations for you know, most of our clientele, especially when we, when we get into uh, aging clientele and really wanting to, to help the aging of their skin. So uh, we'll go into that. Now let me share my screen. get the PowerPoint pulled up here. Okay, there we go. Let me just make sure everyone's muted. Okay, everyone's muted, perfect. Okay, here we go, Skin 101. All right, so, Let me make sure, there we go. I'm like, wait, why isn't this working? Oh, by the way, if you guys have any questions at all, um, feel free to, there's a couple ways you can do it. Uh, feel free to either write into the chat and I'll stop periodically before I move on to a completely different topic. I'll stop, answer the questions you may have on that topic before we move on. Additionally, you can always unmute yourselves as well. Um, when I mute, let me just make sure I did that right. So when I mute all, it asks me, allow participants to unmute yourself. I clicked yes. So you can unmute yourself if you just wanna ask, that's totally fine. Um, or you can write into the chat. Additionally, the length of this, um, the length of this webinar, I kind of have no idea. <laughs> it may be an hour, it may be two. The I had about 100 slides on here and I deleted um, a huge portion of them just because I didn't want it to have to be like four hours for you guys. Um, so what I had deleted was um, skin, really just like skin cancers. And uh, so what I started to think was, you know, people that would still need that, you know, what do typical skin cancers look like, melanoma, um, squamous cell, carcinomas. So that I think is very important as well. So it just gave me an idea of another webinar. So I can do just skin ab abnormalities in general, um, like KP, keratosis polaris, and what it looks like, and, you know, treatments for those things that are benign. They're not, you know, a risk, but we still don't like the look of them. So I will do another webinar with the other half of the slides that I will not cover today. So what I'm covering today is um, the hypodermis, the dermis, the epidermis, those layers, and then um, additionally just overall Fitzpatrick. Okay, so now we'll get started. And I had one question pop up, let me see, or comment, question, comment. Okay, can we get the PowerPoint emailed to us or can we find it at my Viora? Um, so I just created this this week, actually. That's what I've been working on this week, was creating the PowerPoint. So it's not yet on my Viora. Let me look into um, submitting it on there and then being able to get it. Uh, so yeah, let me just do a bit of research and, and um, seeing if we can upload it for you, Hillary, for sure. <clears throat> okay, so skin overview. There, I put a lot of photos of the skin almost on every slide. So you guys have a visual that you can really look at for what I'm um, describing. So the skin is composed of two main layers. We have the epidermis, which has a lot of layers that will break down. So that's made of closely packed epithelial cells. And then the dermis is made of dense, irregular connective tissue that houses a ton of things. So we have blood vessels. I'm gonna point out these different things here. So the dermis has the blood vessels. Epidermis does not, and we'll talk about why. 
So the dermis and the hypodermis have um, the blood vessels. They have the sweat glands to regulate our body temperature. Um, also, the, the vascular not only um, brings nutrients and oxygen to the tissue, what we need to really keep our skin healthy, but they also help regulate our body temperature. So we'll talk about that. And then other structures, you know, we have hair follicles. I'll talk a, a bit about hair follicles when we get into melanin and melanocytes. Uh, when we talk about keratin, uh, we'll talk about the hair as well. Um, and then beneath the dermis lies the hypodermis. So this is the dermis, hypo meaning under. So that's right under the dermis. And that is the hypodermis, which is composed mainly of loose connective and fatty tissue. So that is our um, fat layer. Um, and then we have like sebaceous glands that are here, the sebaceous glands which produce the oil that's right at the hair shaft and that's for a reason uh, and we'll talk about that. Um, so let's move on so we can start breaking these things down. Okay, the importance of understanding the skin. What are the main functions of the skin? So we have protection, right? If we if we scratch ourselves, if um, we have microorganisms, pathogens that we obviously don't want to get into our body, um, protecting us from UV rays. So it is, um, it has a lot of protection and we'll break down how is it protecting our skin. Um, absorption, so think of something like absorbing vitamin D from the sun. We also need to synthesize vitamin D, um, you know, for our bones and other organs. It's very, very vital. Uh, secretion, so think of like sebaceous glands are secreting oil, and that's helping to create a barrier on the skin, additional protection there. Um, but it also keeps our skin youthful, and we'll talk about that. Regulation, so think of like regulating our body temperature. Sweat glands regulate our body temperature, but so does the vascular within, um, within our skin. How does it do that? So think of it when you're exercising, that your face gets very, very flush, right? It's because your body is trying to lose the heat. So it's a ton of vasodilation. Your blood vessels are dilating. Now, when we're cold, we almost have a paleness to our skin. Why is that? Because the body is trying to keep the heat um, within it. So we have vasoconstriction. So that's when the blood vessels constrict and try to keep the heat within the body. And then we have sensation. So we have sensory nerves that um, if you have um, your, your, sorry, the sensory nerves that are closer to the surface of our skin can sense light touch. And then the sensory nerves that are deeper can sense deep touch. So those are the main functions um, of the skin, but we know we're in the cosmetic world, so it goes beyond that. So the human skin, another photo there, the skin is the largest organ. You guys probably knew that, just threw in some facts. Um, though nearly all human skin is covered by um, hair follicles, a lot of it can appear hairless. So um, I, I mean, for some people, it looks like you have no hair on your face. I can see mine, but some people you can barely see. There's still hair follicles there. Um, the places that are absent of hair follicles are the lips, the nipples, genitalia, the palms of our hands, the soles of our feet. So not too many areas that are absent of hair. Pretty much our whole body is covered with it. The thickness of the skin varies considerably um, over all parts of the body. We know that, right? Because of using um, the, the um, VST, for example, we're changing our modes because we know that skin is thicker on the lower face compared to the upper face, right? Um, but that is really across the board for all over our body. So think of like the arms. The arms and the inner thighs are the two places that usually become creepy and there's a lot of laxity there as we age because the skin is thinner compared to like our thighs or our abdomen. So it's considerably different on all parts of the body and especially too between male and female. You guys have probably heard me talk about this a lot that males typically have thicker skin throughout their lives and that is true. And when women hit menopause, I think I'm kind of skipping because I have a slide on that, but when women hit menopause, that's when our um, skin really, really starts to thin where men hold that thicker skin throughout their lives, which is 
unfortunate for us ladies. Um, an example of this, the skin on the forearm, uh, which is on average 1.3 millimeters in a male, is 1.26 millimeters in a female. The average square inch of skin holds 650 sweat glands, 20 blood vessels, 60,000 melanocytes, and more than 1,000 nerve endings. So the skin is really, really fascinating. And we're going to talk about all those different things. I threw this up here just so you guys had an idea. This is not for everyone. Of course, um, males are going to vary from females. Um, different skin types vary. Uh, black skin compared to very pale light skin is going to vary in thickness. Um, our age also contributes to that. But this is kind of on average an idea of how... Um, how thick our skin is on the face and the neck, the decollete. Um, and you can see the thinnest part of our skin is going to be on the eyelids. And it's actually right here is the thinnest part of our skin on the face. So if you're doing like an eyebrow lift with a VST, if they ever jump right there, just because, you know, it's a bit thinner, or if they jump right here, which I do sometimes, I'm like, oh, that was hot. Couldn't it everywhere else is comfortable. Every once in a while, I'll have those bites of heat because that is such a thin, thin area. But there's additional things like sensory nerves and um, other contributing factors. Okay, so male versus female skin. I didn't have this on here originally, and I added this slide yesterday because I just and I just thought it was really fascinating and unfortunate, again, for us females. So male skin is about 25% thicker than that of a woman. Ugh. Um, and, and here are the reasons. So a man's skin thins gradually with age, whereas a woman's skin um, remains kind of constant until about mid 40s and then it dramatically drops off. And that's really our, when we think about like our collagen production. And then after menopause, then our skin will thin at a significant rate. Now, there's, there's other things like if you have really oily skin, now oil production also decreases with menopause and with age in general. But if you have really oily skin when you're younger, as you age, that's going to help keep your skin thicker, right? Because it's just that overall sebum. Think of like dry skin. Dry skin doesn't have that moisture, that protection that will keep it um, really thick throughout somebody's lives. So that's why it is also important to really hydrate throughout our lives, but also wearing things like vitamin C and, um, you know, just creams in general to really keep the skin as thick as we can. But people with oily skin will be a bit luckier there. Maybe they did tend to suffer from acne, which isn't great, and they may have scarring, but on the other side of it, their skin will stay thicker throughout their lives. Um, men have a higher collagen density than women. Um, men have larger pores and produce more sebum, unlike, uh, unlike women. Male sebum production does not decrease with age. So, you know, when they're really oily as teenagers, when they're 60, they're going to be oily then too. And typically with a lot of oil production, comes large pores. Why is that? Because the sebum is just really stretching out that pore size. So that is a, uh, another negative for oily skin is large pores. It's just that our skin stays thicker throughout our lives. Drier skin, they tend to have very small pores, which is great, but then their skin thins uh, prematurely. So there's kind of a, a positive and minus on both. Male skin texture is different than that of a woman. It is tougher and rougher because of thicker stratum corneum. So we'll go through what is the stratum corneum when we start talking about um, the epidermis. But really, it's the outermost layer of our skin. And theirs is just a bit of a rougher texture. So they get a bit more protection um, with that. So here I added... Um, you know, just an idea of, you know, forehead, mid-cheek, jowls, neck, and abdomen, male here on the left, female here on the right, and we can see uh, the thickness of the skin is quite different for male versus female. I also added this just to give you an idea of when I speak about cellulite, if you guys have been on the past webinars and I talk about cellulite and how over 86%, I think it's even 90% at this point of women can suffer from cellulite. And it really doesn't matter how thin they are because it also, we have different hormones than males. So hormones, genetics, women can still have cellulite even when they're thin. And males, it's, it's very rare that you see cellulite on them. And the reason being is that 
their collagen within the hypodermis is a lot more dense. So, and it's irregular. So if they have irregular dense collagen, when it's irregular, it's kind of going in all different directions. So they have more control over those fat cells. We don't have it as much. So it's more likely for our septae or those connective tissue um, to start to get rigid and stretched and, and also for the fat cells to push up more so. And that's when we start getting that orange peel dimpling look and um, that overall just bulging in the area. So I wanted to add a photo of that because I know I talk about that a lot and there you can see why. Okay, so now we'll go into any questions so far. All right. So now we will go into um, the epidermis. So the epidermis is going to be the outermost layer of our skin. And it is mostly made up of flat scale-like cells called squamous cells. And um, under the squamous cells are round cell cells called basal cells. Now I'm going to talk about the different layers of the epidermis and they can be pronounced very differently. Um, so I just want to, you know, throw that out there. If you hear it pronounced differently than what I'm saying it as, you know, it's still the same thing. There's just a lot of pronunciation pronunciations for it. Uh, the deepest part of the epidermis also contains melanocytes. So I have a few slides on, um, on melanocytes because they're so important within our industry, within our field. I also have quite a few slides on um, these overall squamous cells that are within the epidermis and what they are doing for us cosmetically and what we can do to them cosmetically. Uh, the epidermis is avascular, meaning there is no capillaries that reach into the epidermis. So if you scratch yourself and you do not bleed, you've only reached to the epidermis. If you scratch yourself and do bleed, you are reaching deeper into the actual dermis, the papillary and reticular dermis, where that is very, very vascular. So it is going to be avascular in the epidermis. It's pretty much dead tissue in, in the epidermis. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to the next slide just because it breaks down um, these layers a bit more. Okay, so different, different ways to pronounce these. I'm just going to tell you them and then I'm just going to say it the way I pronounce it. So it can be stratum or stratum. I prefer saying it as stratum. So all of these layers start with that stratum, stratum corneum. You can also hear it as um, corneum. So I like to say, say stratum corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum. And then the last one is pronounced three different ways, basale, basale, and basal. I like to say basal. <laughs> okay, so we'll break these down. I'm going to start here at the very bottom. This is where really all the activity happens is within the stratum basale, bas uh, basal. So this anchors the epidermis to the dermis. Oops, sorry guys. Um, anchors the epidermis to the dermis. So this is the very bottom layer that's actually attached to, to the lower um, depths of the papillary and reticular dermis. There's actually another layer right in between there called the dermal papillae or papillae. And that is what's actually attaching it. But, you know, we don't have fully go through that. That's just really, that's what it does. It just attaches the epidermis to the dermis. Um, this layer contains the regeneration cells for all of the epidermis. So this is where all the activity is happening. Stem cells are in this level. They create basal cells and keratin cells for migration. They also contain melanocytes, which most of you guys probably know, melanocytes are um, producing pigment. So that's what gives us the color of our skin. Not going to go into that too deep because I have a few slides coming up for that. Um, okay, so in this layer of our skin, this is where our cells really start to generate and they start to divide. So one of the daughter cells will release and move upward. One of the other cells, the daughter cells, will stay attached and it just keeps dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing. And then we have mitosis and they start to move up and as they move up, they start to die. So when they get to the very top here, the stratum corneum, all of those skin cells will be dead for a couple reasons. Keratin is 
starts to come into the cells. And keratin is a protein that really allows them to die and move upward. Well, they move upward anyways, but they start to die. So why is this so important for all of these dead skin cells to be up here on top is because it, it is what is protecting our skin. All of those dead skin cells are um, protecting us from pathogens, from any bacteria, microbacteria getting into our, into our tissue. It also is going to help with, like I was saying, like you scratch yourself, any abrasion that happens to your skin, you're not going to bleed out. Um, it also helps protect us just from environmental factors, um, sun, and then all the other environmental factors that we face every day. So these dead skin cells are very, very important. So I'll talk about these other layers of the skin too. Um, so as they divide and they generate in, in the basal layer, then they move up to the spinosum. These cells control lipids that migrate to the corneum and contribute to skin moisture. So that is a huge thing is that when these become flat and dead, it also locks in all of our hydration within our skin. Without this, really lipid layer of controlling the moisture in our skin, we would be <laughs> shriveled up like raisins. So it's going to keep all the moisture deeper in our tissue. Um, then it's the granulosum. So the cells start to just move up to the granulosum. This layer signals the transition of cells. Keratin loses its nucleus and organelles become flat, moving um, into the corneum. So essentially cells begin to die here. So we're starting to get death to those cells that generated in the basal cell. And then lucidum. Not, we, we have something considered thin skin and thick skin on our body. Almost everywhere in our body is thin skin. And there's two places that have thick skin. And that's the soles of our feet and the palms of our hand. Why? Because we, we need more protection on the soles of our feet and the palms of our hand. This is where we do everything, right? So the, um, the rest of the skin does not have this layer, lucidum. Only the soles of our feet and the palms of our hand have this fifth layer, and that's the lucidum. Because those areas need more protection, it's a thin, clear band of cells, and it just helps aid in, in a bit more... Um, uh, uh, just abrasions in general and making sure that we stay um, protected in those areas. And then the last layer, the stratum corneum, is going to be the outermost layer of the skin where dead skin, skin cells are and they eventually slough off. There can be up to 15 to 30 layers within the stratum corneum. So we have a lot of dead skin cells that are hanging out there and over time they eventually shed, uh, slough off. So now I want you to think of like microdermabrasion. Why is it so important? Well, now that we understand that we can have 15 to 30 layers of dead skin cells, and now we know that, you know, they're, they're really, you know, alive down here and they're producing and reproducing and um, dividing and we have a ton of skin cells that are moving upward and they start to die. Now think of like doing radiofrequency or IPL, light-based treatments, and wanting to get to those deeper depths, like the, the main dermis, the papillary and reticular dermis, or even into these skin cells for rejuvenation. It's hard to really get, a, you know, 100% of that energy into the tissue because our skin naturally wants to protect and block a lot of things. So, you know, it's going to block against like UV, it's going to block against like abrasions, it's going to um, block against um, pathogens. So you have a lot of protection there. So it's okay though, it's 15 to 30 layers of dead skin cells to microderm them, remove a lot of them so we can get that depth of penetration that we're really wanting. Additionally, microdermabrasion is just gonna make the skin look that much better to get rid of some of those dead skin cells. We don't want all of those on our skin because it just makes us look very dull. So, nor do we need that many. So that's why microdermabrasion is so, so important, pretty much a staple within your office because it preps the skin beforehand. Um, and then we know microdermabrasion has a vacuum, so it increases blood circulation as well. So we'll talk about that when we get into the dermis and why that's so important. Um, so that is the epidermis. Well, I'm not done. 
just a breakdown. Um, I probably already said a lot of these things, but I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. So the stratum corneum, the stratum corneum is the, uh, the most superficial layer of the skin. Um, it's the layer that it's exposed to the outside environment. It's usually 15 to 30 layers of dead skin cells. Um, this dry dead layer helps prevent the penetration of, like I was saying, any pathogens, dehydration from the underlying tissue, making sure that we don't have a lot of moisture loss because it creates a waterproof barrier as it's going through those stages. Um, I talked about all that. Cells in this layer are shed periodically and are replaced by cells pushed up from the stratum granulosum. Remember, when you do microdermabrasion, don't think like, oh my gosh, we're removing all of our skin cells. No, they are constantly, constantly being produced in the basal layer, dividing, um, and we have a lot of skin cells that are there. Uh, the entire layer is replaced during a period of about four weeks. So you probably have heard of that before, that our skin cells turn over every 28 to 30 days. Now, I wanna go back just to show you guys something really quick. This whole process, when, when those um, cells generate and then they start to divide and they start to push up, from here to the granulosum, that takes two weeks. Then they hang out in the stratum corneum dead for another two weeks. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, cosmetic procedures such as microdermabrasion help remove some of the dry upper layer and aim to keep the skin looking fresh and healthy. Uh, if you guys have had a microdermabrasion, you know exactly what that feels like. Your skin feels like a baby because you don't have all that rough dead skin um, and you just look overall healthier. Okay, so now we're going to break down, um, th this is pronounced a couple different ways too, keratinocytes or keratinocytes. Um, so I'll just call them keratinocytes just because I don't like the pronunciation of keratinocytes. Just, they don't sound great. <laughs> um, so here's another photo, very, very similar. But that's what all of these skin cells are, are these keratinocytes. So the primary function of keratinocytes is the formation of a barrier against environmental damage. So we talked about this. Keratinocytes are produced by stem cells in the stratum basale or basal. Once the keratinocytes move more than three cells away from the dermis, mitosis stops. Um, so that's where death happens. And, and another thing is why are they really dying when they leave the, the basal layer is also remember that there is no blood in the epidermis, right? We don't have any type of capillaries in the epidermis. So when you start to move away from a blood source, you, they immediately start to die. Additionally, keratin, that protein, is inside of them, and that also causes death. Same with a hair follicle. A hair follicle um, generates in the hypodermis, and that's coming up in just a bit. And it dies very quickly as it moves up into the epidermis because it's getting away from its blood source and also its keratin. So keratin is inside that hair follicle, and it causes death. So all of our keratin in our hair, this is all dead, which is really weird to think about. Um, okay, so I, I spoke about lipids that really create that waterproof um, layer. The epidermal water barrier forms on top of the stratum spinosum and prevents water loss, dehydration, cells um, near the surface die. So sorry, I jumped ahead. <laughs> I should have waited until that slide. Okay, one of my favorite things to talk about, melanocytes. So I have two slides on this just because they're so important to know and understand. So melanocytes are also in the basal layer. So let me go back, actually. I think there was another photo of um, melanocytes here. So here's a melanocyte also within the stratum basal. And their function, and actually they're, they're kind of cool cells. They, let me see if I have a photo here. Yeah, here. They're kind of cool cells because they almost look like they have tentacles. So the cell kind of is surrounding all of the keratinocytes that are within the epidermis. They don't go up too far, but it's almost like they have little tentacles. Um, so melanocytes are found in the skin, hair, eyes, and ears, actually. So um, loss of melanocyte in the ear can also cause um, deafness, which is crazy. Um, but our eye color, my eyes are green, so I do not have a lot of melanin, right? Otherwise, they would be brown. Um, 
my hair is brown though. So I have quite a bit of melanin within my hair. Actually, it's starting to turn gray. So it's the complete loss of melanin. Um, and of course, it's found in the skin. So that's what's giving us our skin, the, the pigment that we see. Somebody that is from Africa, somebody that is from Jamaica, somebody that's from South America, um, typically have a lot more pigment than, um, you know, Norwegians would, of course. Um, there's approximately one melanocyte per five to 10 keratinocytes or keratinocytes. Um, melanosums, the pigment granules that provide tissue with color and photoprotection are the cellular side of synthesis, storage, and transport of melanin pigments. So what happens is the melanocytes are producing the melanosums, and those melanosums um, are providing granules, dark granules, within the keratinocytes. So it's really, um, think of how those keratinocytes migrate up to the surface. When those melanosums are inside the keratinocytes, they're doing the exact same thing. They're moving upward and eventually they're going to shed. So think of that like when you get a suntan. So I'll just take myself as an example that I'm a skin type two. I think I'm a two. I, don't, I wouldn't consider myself a three unless I have a spray tan, which doesn't count. So I'm a skin type two. Um, I can burn easily, but if I wear sunscreen, I can start to get a tan. Is that tan gonna, gonna last for very long? No. Why? Because all of those cells, the, the melanocytes that were really producing a lot of pigment at that point to protect my skin, so I have more and more of those melanosome granules within the keratinocytes are just going to push up. And when they push up, what are they going to do? They're going to shed. So then my, my suntan goes away. So really, it's it, in my opinion, it's never worth being tan, even though um, us lighter people love the, the look of a tan, right? It just We think it makes us look a lot healthier. Um, so it's really not worth it. A tan's going to last 28, 30 days at, at the most um, if you're staying out of the sun afterwards. Um, and it's doing so much damage to our underlying tissue. So we'll talk about that in just a bit too. Um, melanosomes that are found in melanocytes can be transported in nearby keratinocytes to induce pigmentation. What they're doing is they're, they're there to absorb and reflect UV radiation. So they're there to protect the underlining layers, really the more important layers of our skin, which are the papillary and the reticular dermis. I'm going to break those down in just a bit. But those layers, really, that's what has all of our collagen, elastin, what gives us our strength to our skin. So those melanocytes are so important because they produce pigment that then reflect the light away so we keep our, our layers of skin strong underneath. Now, think of like darker skin that just have that pigment naturally, that they have built-in sunscreen pretty much. And that's why a skin type six, think of like, um, uh, like Jamaican or African, um, compared to myself, when uh, somebody from Africa is 60 years old and I'm 60 years old, there's probably going to be a big difference in the way we look with aging. They're probably going to look a lot younger than myself. Why? Because they did not get their collagen elastin beat down with those sun rays as I would have in my, in my life if I wasn't careful, you know, if I wasn't wearing sunscreen and, and being really careful. So that's why lighter skin types can prematurely age or look prematurely aged compared to darker skin types because they have so much protection, absorption, and reflection uh, for their deeper dermis. Um, hair color is determined by the amount of melanin transferred to the keratinocytes forming the hair shaft. So um, when somebody has blonde or gray hair, there is really, um, blonde has some, some pigment in it, gray is absent of all. Um, and blonde hair, why it doesn't really respond well to, to laser is because there's, a, or IPL, is there's a lack of pigment there. And remember, the lasers that you're using for hair removal, the IPL that you're using for hair removal, it wants to be attracted to the darkness, the pigment, and that's what it wants to find. So there's an absence of, of really a lot of pigment in the area. Uh, reduction in number and activity of melanocytes occurs with aging. You guys may notice this if you're, I'd say, older than 30, um, six to eight percent per decade. 
Um, this, along with sun exposure, le leads to graying of hair and lightening of skin color. So you may notice in your 20s, in your teens, it was so easy to get a deep, dark tan if you're lighter skin type. Like, oh, I used to be so tan, and you're really a skin type too. But each decade, you're losing about 6 to 8% of those um, melanocytes producing that, the melanosomes. So when we're in our 40s and 50s and we go to tan, it's like, why can't I get tan anymore? Uh, same reason of why is my hair graying? It's the lack of melanin within the skin. So it's not even worth it to try to tan when you're older. You're not going to really get there like you used to. Plus, it's just damaging your collagen elastin. Plus, it could lead, lead to skin cancer. There's just nothing good um, when you go out in the sun trying to get tan, especially when we're older. Okay, so a little bit more about melanosomes. I like this photo a lot. So actually, here's the photo of the melanocyte, and see how it kind of almost looks like a little octopus with tentacles that's kind of moving up and into these um, around these keratinocytes. And these little granules will eventually get inside there. And um, so here's a picture of dark skin and here's a picture of light skin. Uh, dark skin, okay, so about almost all of us really have the exact same amount of melanocytes. So Denzel Washington and Nicole Kidman have the same amount of melanocytes. It's just that Denzel Washington's melanocytes produce more of the melanosomes. So um, there, it's going to be two things that he's producing more melanosomes and the melanosomes that are the granules that are being produced are larger as well. So more of them and, and they're also additionally larger. So I probably already spoke about all these bullet points, but let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, light skin melanosomes are found predominantly in the basal layer. So you can see in this photo um, that really the, the, um, the pigment in light skin is staying very deep. In, in the basal layer. But darker skin, those granules will also be, um, uh, be apparent in all of the layers of the skin. So dark skin melanosomes are found in the basal layer and into the epidermis, including the stratum corneum. So of course it has to include the stratum corneum because we can see that they have dark skin, right? And um, the stratum corneum is the outermost layer. So they are really well protected. Their entire epidermis is really filled with all of these large, larger, and a lot of these melanosomes, these granules. We're light skin, meh, we have very little, uh, and, and it's predominantly deeper in, in the basal layer. Um, it requires about 10 days after initial sun exposure for melanin synthesis to peak, which is why pale-skinned individuals tend to suffer sunburns of the epidermis initially. So think of that, that when we go out in the sun um, and we are light-skinned without sunscreen, if it takes 10 days for the synthesis to happen, uh, we are, of course, going to have a sunburn because we don't have those granules to protect us. But then as we have a bit more of a tan and we have that melanin synthesis, then we have a bit more protection of the sun, right? You guys probably know this is light skin. You get sunburned the first day of summer, you get a bit tan, and now it's kind of hard to get sunburned again throughout the summer. It doesn't mean that you're fully protected though, because remember, you don't have the, the natural uh, melanosomes that darker skin um, uh, people do have, which of course they're lucky because of it. Uh, so you still have to be careful. Um, dark skin individuals can also get sunburn, but are more protected than our pale skin individuals. Uh, oh, you know what? I was going to talk about something, but I have a slide coming up on it. Melanosomes are temporary structures, melanin filled keratinocytes, and the stratum corneum sloughing off uh, makes tanning, it's never going to be, um, it's never going to last forever, right? It's always going to shed because those skin cells are always shedding. Okay, any questions so far? I'll just stop for a second to give you guys a moment.
Okay. So, oh, we got one. All right. Nope. You're doing great as always. <laughs> Thank you. Who was that? You don't have a name on here. Um, okay. Tell me who you are. Heather. Hello. <laughs> um, okay. So now we will go into the dermis. Um, I know I kind of keep saying it's the most important, really the, the main part of our skin and it really is because it gives our skin its full full structure um, but of course the epidermis is very very important uh, for all of the things that we just learned uh, making sure we stay stay well um, uh, protected and hydrated and you know all those fun things Our true skin, most important. Yes, Cynthia, <laughs> it is. When we when we think about our cosmetic world, um, it is it's our true skin and the most important. Um, but of course, the epidermis is is also um, very important as well. Okay, so now we'll go into the dermis. So we have two layers of the dermis. We have the papillary dermis and the reticular dermis. The papillary dermis is a much thinner layer and it's the upper part of the dermis and it's connected to the epidermis. And then the reticular dermis is much thicker. It's about 80% of the dermis. Um, so we'll break down those two. So the papillary, most, super, blah, blah, most superficial layer of the dermis, which I spoke about, is the first skin layer to contain capillaries. So again, if you scratch yourself and don't bleed, you've only reached into the epidermis. If you scratch yourself and bleed, you could be in the papillary dermis because that's where capillaries are present. Or you could, you know, be deeper in the reticular dermis, which is, by the way, um, if you cut yourself, if you have... Um, uh, like a deep cut or um, really bad cystic acne, it's not it's not the greatest because when you reach into the reticular dermis, this is when more scars can can be present after you've healed. Uh, where the papillary dermis, you're not as susceptible to scarring. So when you really reach deep into the dermis into the reticular dermis, it's more prone to scarring. Um, okay, so we have. Um, small blood vessels, small nerves, and lymphatic vessels. By the way, I am not going to fully go into lymphatics. Um, so I was also thinking that maybe I could do in the future um, the, the kind of like, uh, I don't know what I would call it, but Skin 101 Part 2 of covering like skin cancers and, um, you know, things like that, things to look for on the skin. And additionally, more of like lymphatic system and, and some of that kind of stuff, when it, how it relates to cosmetic treatment. So um, I kind of like that I have, you know, ideas coming up for webinars because I never want to run out of ideas for these. So uh, we'll, we'll dive deeper on another webinar. Okay, so then we have the reticular dermis. The reticular dermis is located beneath the papillary dermis and rests on a thick pad of fat known as the subcutaneous. So we'll go through the subcutaneous next. Um, and it contains hair follicles, sebaceous glands, and again, this layer makes up 80% of the dermis. Um, it's composed of strong connected tissue known as reticula. So Oh, you know what? Never mind. I was going to jump, but I have more slides coming up explaining that. Um, the main cell component of the dermis is fibroblast. And you guys probably heard me say that a lot, that we need to stimulate fibroblast cells. Fibroblast cells, that is what produces, remodels, structures our um, collagen and elastin. Um, so it produces the collagen elastin fibers within our skin. And the collagen and fiber elastins that are in our skin are surrounded by fibroblast cells. The dermis houses glycosaminoglycans. Glycosaminoglycans. It's a very long word, so most people call it GAGSs. GAGs. Uh, S's, I don't know why I said that, GAGs, um, which are vital to the amount of moisture in the skin. So we'll break down um, what glyco glycosaminoglycans are in um, maybe the next slide. Let's see. Oof, okay. 
first. <laughs> I, have a, I have a lot of text here. Um, okay, so the dermis is located beneath the epidermis. We know that. The thickest of the three layers of the skin, it can range from 1.5 to 4 millimeters thick, depending on where is it on the body. Is it on our abdomen? Is it on our face? Um, it can really vary in thickness making up approximately 90% of the thickness of our skin. The main functions of the dermis are to regulate temperature. So remember, this is where our blood vessels are now located. So that is what helps regulate our temperature. Of course, vascular does more than just regulate our temperature. Vascular also brings in oxygen, nutrients, um, proteins to our skin. Um, but it also helps regulate the body temperature with vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Um, okay, so regulate body temperature and to supply the epidermis with nutrient-saturated blood. Because remember, really the only active layer within the epidermis is the very bottom. So why is it and how can it be so active is because it's right there where the blood supply is because it's connected to the papillary dermis. Um, much of the body's Water supply is stored within the dermis, so that's why it's important for those dead skin cells on the epidermis. Keep it in. We want to keep it in the dermis. Uh, this layer contains most of the skin's specialized cells and structures, including blood vessels, lymph vessels. So blood vessels, uh, we, we, I spoke about this a lot, nutrients, oxygen to the skin, and take away cell waste. Um, we, we speak about this when we are doing like body contouring or cellulite reduction that we increase circulation, microcirculation, and when we shrink those um, fat cells down, it, it eventually will, will end up in the blood supply which then carries waste out, everything really that we're taking out of the fat cell. And then additionally, lymphatic vessels are there to carry out any of the excess edema, which is water concentration within the tissue. Uh, the lymph vessels uh, bathe the tissues of the skin with lymph, a milky substance that, that contains infection-fighting cells of the immune system. Um, it helps with, with the lymphatic, because the lymphatic eventually will connect back to the vascular system and the the lymph will help um, really fight off any bacteria before it enters back into the bloodstream. The lymphatic uh, system is really fascinating. Um, so these cells work to destroy any infection, invading organisms as the lymph circulates to the lymph nodes. It also helps to um, reduce, like I was saying, edema and water in the skin because um, the, the uh, vascular system, you know, is pumping blood throughout our body and we have large arteries that then become um, uh, uh, arterioles and capillaries, the small capillaries that are found in the dermis. And the, those small capillaries will then release, like, you know, like I was saying, oxygen and nutrients into the tissue, but additionally water. So the lymphatic will then take that water and, and get rid of it so we don't have, you know, a ton of swelling within our body because that wouldn't be good. Um, hair follicles. The hair follicles, a tube-shaped sheath that surrounds uh, the part of the hair that is under the skin and, and um, uh, I think nourishes the hair. I'm sorry, I can't see because my face is covering a lot of this. Sweat glands. The average person has about 3 million sweat glands. I knew that last night when I was playing tennis. Um, and sweat glands are going to help uh, uh, regulate the body temperature, right? Because we can, um, we're, we're sweating all of that water out that then cools the body. Um, by the way, hair follicles, unless you remove it with, um, with lasers and IPL, but hair also helps keep us warm. And there is something called the erectile, uh, erector helial, oh, I can't talk, heli muscle, um, that th th really when it's activated, it gives us goosebumps. So when do we get goosebumps? We get them when um, we're cold, we get them when we're scared. So really the, the purpose of what they're supposed to do, which they don't, they don't serve a huge purpose within humans, they serve a bigger purpose within animals. But within humans, um, the idea is that when we get goosebumps, the hairs stand up, and it's really supposed to keep the um, the um, 
the heat really on the outside of the body in and circulating within the hair follicles. I mean, our hair is kind of fuzzy in most places, so it doesn't really work all that well, but that's the idea behind it. Um, sebaceous glands, very important. Uh, sebaceous or oil or oil glands are attached to hair follicles and can be found everywhere on the body. Um, of course, uh, except for the palms, the hands, the soles of the feet. Um, these glands secrete oil that helps keep the skin smooth and supple. The oil also um, helps keep skin waterproof. So it also helps keep hair somewhat waterproof and additionally our skin. But it really helps lock, uh, lock in moisture too. I mean, sebum is kind of like a natural moisturizer. You can think of it like that. I wanted to point this out. Oily skin uh, people tend to heal quicker with treatments than dry skin. So um, uh, think of like IPL when you're trying to remove hyperpigmentation. Um, or if you guys have the VFR, if you guys are overseas or if you're within our study and you have the VFR, which is the fractionated ablative treatment, so it burns the surface of the skin in a sense. And we want you to wear an emollient, a really thick emollient, not just a moisturizer, but a really thick really waterproof emollient. Why? Because it helps speed up healing. So same thing with oily skin. When somebody has a lot of sebum because they have a lot of moisture on the skin, it they tend to heal quicker. So if somebody, if you're getting rid of their sunspots with the IPL, they should still be wearing like sunscreen and moisturizer. But in addition, if they're oily, their sunspots tend to leave the face quicker than somebody with dry skin. Uh, nerve endings. The dermis layer also contains pain and touch receptors that transmit sensation of pain, itch, pressure, information regarding temperature to the brain for interpretation. Um, now think of like using the VST. What do I always say? Lots and lots of pressure. It's, it's uh, going to make the patients a lot more comfortable, right? Why? Because we're tricking these nerve receptors. These nerve receptors are going to feel heat. And if they feel strong heat, your brain, it's going to go to your brain and you're going to go, whoa, I don't like this. So when you use pressure, your nerve um, sensory, those receptors will, um, will your brain will go, oh, I feel pressure. Then you apply the heat and it's kind of confusing your brain. Do I feel pressure? Do I feel heat? I don't know. So I'm comfortable. But if you just barely have it on the skin and then release the pulse and there is the, those pain receptors are like, whoa, that was strong heat. I don't like this. Your patient's not going to really be able to sit through it. When you use pressure, though, they it, same with the IPL when you're doing like pigment um, or you're doing hair removal. Same thing. A lot of pressure. Those pain receptors are kind of confused. So they don't feel the heat as strongly. Um, I just want to mention, because I'm talking about pressure in the IPL, the only time you can't use pressure is over vascular. So somebody has broken capillaries on their cheeks, for example. When you use pressure, think of it like vasoconstricting. You're constricting that vessel, therefore you don't have a blood source to target. So unfortunately with vascular, you, you don't want to use pressure because you want that light to find the blood within the area, the hemoglobin. Um, okay, and then the dermis also has collagen elastin. This is our important part, right, with, um, with being in the cosmetic world. So the dermis is held together by a protein called collagen made of fibroblasts. So remember, fibroblast cells are surrounding that collagen within the dermis. Fibroblasts are skin cells um, that give, I'm sorry, fibroblasts are skin cells that give the skin its strength and resilience. So collagen really makes the skin strong. Think of it like that. Um, so collagen is a tough protein found throughout the body in connected tissues that hold muscle and organs in place. Um, there's a ton of different types of collagen. There's either 19 types of collagen, but some white papers I've read that they found over 26 types of collagen. There's a lot, lot of different types of collagen within our whole body. But the types of collagen within our skin are one in three, primarily type one. I think I have a slide about that coming up. 
Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Um, okay. In the skin, collagen supports the epidermis, lending its durability. Elastin is a similar protein, is the substance that allows the skin to spring back into place when stretched or pulled. So collagen really gives us the strength of the skin, the thickness and the strength, where elastin allows it to bounce back into place. So when you start to get really, you know, sagging skin, it's also a problem with the elastin that it's not bouncing back as it used to. Then we start to see really thin skin, we can see we don't have a lot of collagen production because you can see it's thinned out and it's not as thick. When we have a lot of collagen, it's thick and it's really, really uh, strong too. Any questions on any of that? Okay. Okay, so collagen. Collagen is a structural protein, the most abundant protein in the body, about 75% of skin's dry weight and one third of body weight. So a lot of collagen within the body. Um, because it is a large protein, collagen does not penetrate the skin. So when you hear things like, um, or if you Google, you know, um, I don't know, collagen uh, cream or something like that, like collagen that you put onto the skin, it's not going to, that's, that's not a thing. Collagen is a very large protein. It's not going to absorb down into the dermis where it would need to be. We need our body to produce collagen. We can't put it on our skin topically. Um, what you, what is important though, is putting things on your skin topically to keep it hydrated, moisturized, protected. So those are the things that are important, but taking collagen supplements and um, putting collagen creams on, that's not going to work. What we can do though, is eat really good food and nourish our body. So, um, you know, we're doing it within a lot of water intake, a lot of good food intake. Um, that, that is important. The majority of collagen, 80 to 90% in the body is type 1 and 3 and type 5. Um, type 1 is the most abundant. So um, uh, 80 to 90% is, is uh, oh, yeah, 80 to 90% is type 1, I believe. Uh, collagen is tough. And I'm, if I have that percentage off, I may have that percentage off, so I'll have to look. Uh, collagen is tough and does not stretch easily. So again, it's that strong protein. Uh, it provides strength to the skin and holds the skin together. Collagen requires vitamin C and iron. So again, like I was saying, when we're eating the right foods, um, things that are, are um, high in vitamin C, high in iron, to form healthy protein fibers. So it's really what we're ingesting. And whenever I do presentations on things like this, I have to sit back and kind of question myself. Like, oh my gosh, I'm in this industry. Of course I want my skin to, to look as good as it can. Um, and you sit back and think like, am I eating really well? You know, you, you start to realize the importance of what you're putting into your body. Um, so I kind of like doing these presentations because then I'm like, all right, I'm going to get on a health kick. In the absence of vitamin C, collagen forms abnormal fibers, the results in skin lesions, fragile skin, and blood vessels. That's why vitamin C is such a um, popular like serum to put on the skin. Um, okay, collagen is produced and recycled throughout life. But with age, the rate of collagen production slows down. We all know this. That's why we have your systems. After about age 40, the decline accelerates due to the increase in enzymes that degrade collagen. It's so unfortunate. Um, I was waiting for this day to come. I'm 39. Now the day is here. Um, I'm really happy that I started in my younger years <laughs> doing treatments. Um, and now I really have to start considering, you know, maybe my treatments need to change because I don't do a ton of radio frequency. I more so do a lot of IPL skin rejuvenation treatments where radio frequency is very targeted to our collagen. So I think I'm going to have to switch it up and start doing more RF on my skin over 40. Um, and then after menopause, whew, our skin really changes as females. So um, that's a good thing to know, like in, in consultations, if they are um, premenopausal or, you know, they're, they're going through it or they just finished it, 
Um, those are important things to know as you're talking to your clients and really understanding their skin and their skin changes and um, how many treatments they're going to need, uh, what kind of results to expect. You know, if someone's 40 and they already have a lot of collagen and, and their body already wants to produce still collagen um, and they don't have a lot of loose skin, you know, that's, it's very different when you're dealing with a patient like that compared to a patient that's 65. So just always keep that in mind. It's not that they're not going to get a result. Of course, we can get beautiful results on, on um, women that are uh, postmenopausal. It's just, you know, setting those realistic expectations, knowing, okay, they may need a few more treatments that some, than somebody who's 50, who's, who's not in menopause. Um, wrinkles and sagging are partly due to damaged collagen and slower rate of collagen production relative to the, to the rate of, um, I cannot read that because something is in my way, uh, but you guys can read it. <laughs> so, it's the the reason why it says wrinkles and sag, sagging are partly due to damaged collagen is it's not just collagen it's also the elastin um, it's also the loss of gly, glycosaminoglycans <laughs> GAGs so we'll talk about that too okay elastin first we'll talk about elastin elastin is a protein and there is very little of it about one to two percent of dry weight of skin so not like collagen uh where it's there's a lot of it like collagen though elastin is a fibrous protein but it is chemically very different from collagen while collagen is tough elastin is highly stretchy and resilient providing elasticity to the skin so that's important. We want our collagen to be really tough and strong and keeping our skin strong. And we want that elastin to really have um, a stretchiness so our skin can bounce back. Now, elastin starts to kind of lose that ability as we age though, which is unfortunate, but we have Viora. Um, elastin gives the snap or bounce back reaction when skin is stretched, pinched, or pulled. Aging elastin is a major contributor to sagging and wrinkling. So I'm going to go back to this slide, collagen, right here, this bullet point. Wrinkles and sag sagging are partly due to damaged collagen. And then elastin, aging elastin is a major contributor to sagging and wrinkling. So collagen, you know, when, when we think of like, well, why is my skin sagging? It's, it's really, I mean, it, it does have something to do with collagen for sure, but Collagen is more so, why is my skin so thin? Because you have a loss of collagen. The sagging is more so the elastin is not as strong as it used to be. Um, but good news, elastin is a very long-lived protein with a half-life of over 78 years in humans. So that elastin really lasts our whole life. It's just how strong is it throughout our life? So that's why uh, radio frequency treatments are, are very important to restructure that elastin. Here we go, glycosaminoglycans. It's kind of fun to say. Um, so they're amino sugars, a sugar linked with a protein. So again, we, we're, um, we're in proteins. Together with water, they create a fluid that fills the space between the collagen and elastin fibers in the dermis, giving it turgidity. I'm not sure if you guys know what turgidity is, but here's how I, how I can explain turgidity. Um, if you have a house plant or someone purchased you flowers and a week later, let's say you forgot to water your house plant or a week later, those flowers start to die. I'm just going to take that house plant as an example that it starts to, and it, right, it starts to kind of hang down because it doesn't have turgidity. When you give it water, and that water then brings it to life, that is turgidity. Um, the gel-like fluid is called the ground substance. So GAGs are very important to the skin. They are, um, uh, I'll talk about that in just a, bit, uh, just a bit, I got really excited. There are various glycosaminoglycans in the dermis. The most common one is hyaluronic acid. We hear it all the time, right? Hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid. Um, what are a lot of fillers made of? Hyaluronic acid. It fills in the area with these glycosaminoglycans. So it gives us that fullness to our face, that 
coldness to our skin. Collagen makes it strong. It gives it strength, but it doesn't give the fullness. Elastin gives us our bounce back. So we, so we have that beautiful, not, you know, sagging down skin, but a bounce back to our tissue. Then we have to have these GAGs because it, then it just fills in the space and it gives us that, that um, fullness to our tissue. Um, hyaluronic acid is a glycosaminoglycan that exists naturally in the, in the dermal layers or dermis layer of the skin. It can hold 1,000 times its molecular weight in water. So that's why it's so great as a filler. Um, with age, the amount of hyaluronic acid in the dermis declines steeply after 40 and most significantly, significantly in our fifth decade. So we really start to lose this and we start to lose the fullness of our face, right? So, um, you know, a lot of our offices uh, do Viora treatments, yes, but they also offer things like Botox and filler and they use Viora in combination with these things. So they will do a series of, let's just say, radio frequency to the face to tighten the skin, to uh, reduce the wrinkles because we're building more collagen, we're helping the elastin in the area, um, and they look beautiful, right? Their, their skin is tighter, their wrinkles are reduced, but there's hollows in the area still. So this is the loss of this, the, glyco the glycosaminoglycans. So that's why they're then injecting the filler to fill in the loss of that. So that's how they really work um, well hand in hand with one another. Uh, the, key, the key thing to know about glycosaminoglycans is that they are water binding some substances. The GAGs and the ground substance of the dermis attract water brought to the dermis by blood vessels. So we talked about that, that the blood vessels, um, when they get to the capillary size, that's when the capillary, when, when they get to the capillary size in the dermis, that's when they start to release water. Um, they release other things too, but water is a big one. So um, the dermis attract water brought to the dermis by blood vessels. Water in the dermis also diffuses the lower layers of the epidermis and eventually migrate upward through the epidermal layers. And that's why we have that barrier. I know I keep saying that, but just as a reminder. Okay, I need a sip of water. Any questions? By the way, there's a, a, oh, I said that, but there's a lot of different glycosaminoglycans in the skin. Um, I just spoke about the most common hyaluronic acid because we all know it, <laughs> um, but there's a lot of different ones. No questions. Okay. So now we'll break down um, the different layers of the dermis uh, a bit more. So the papillary dermis. The papillary dermis contains less collagen and elastin than the reticular dermis. The reticular dermis really houses most of it. Um, the papillary dermis also has thinner collagen and elastin fibers, where the reticular dermis has much thicker uh, collagen fibers and elastin fibers. Um, and they are more randomly arranged within the papillary dermis with a high percentage perpendicular to the skin surface. Uh, papillary dermis contains small blood vessels of capillary size and nerve endings. We spoke about this a lot. Uh, the reticular dermis. Oh, I guess I kind of repeated myself. I'm so sorry. Um, the bulk of the dermis, 80% of it, it is composed of broad bands of dense irregular collagen. Uh, with intervening long, thick fibers of elastin, which usually runs parallel to the skin surface. So in the reticular dermis, it is, um, it is a very irregular, dense and irregular, which is a good thing. When we have dense and irregular, that's what gives us really our, our strength to our skin. Because when they're running every which way and they're kind of crossing over one another, instead of just Hair, um, instead of just vertical or horizontal, we get a lot more um, strength and structure to the skin. Men's are even more uh, dense and irregular. Within this tissue are blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves of the skin. All right, now we'll go into hypodermis. 
So the hypodermis, hypo meaning underneath the dermis, um, and another name for the hypodermis is the subcutaneous tissue. Oh, you know what? I forgot to tell you guys something. Let me go back just for a sec, all the way back to the epidermis, sorry. If you guys are just learning about skin and you want to remember these layers of the epidermis, I'm going to give you a mnemonic to, to um, help remember if you're studying over stuff, um, it, which is complete opposite of what I'm talking about, of never getting sun exposure because it completely damages our collagen and elastin. Um, and uh, always wearing sunscreen. But the mnemonic is come, let's get sun burned. <laughs> so come, let's get sunburn. Corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and basale or basil or basal. Forgot to give you that little mnemonic. I wrote it down in my notes here, but probably forgot a few things. Let me see. Oh, I did forget a few things. Before I go into the hypodermis, I forgot to look at my notes. Um, so I wanted to talk about like calluses and why do we have calluses on our feet or our hands? I have a really big one right now on my thumb because I started playing tennis again. Um, and the reason we get calluses on our feet or like the one on my thumb is from a lot of abrasion. And when we have a lot of abrasion, our skin senses that and it wants to protect. And it protects by um, dividing even more of those cells in the basal layer of the epidermis. So it's just really producing a ton, dividing a ton, and now we have even more skin cells, which are something that we really don't like. But I'm actually kind of loving this callus here because when I played tennis last night, my thumb didn't hurt as much, right? So that's what's happening. It's, it's um, helping protect our skin, not a horrible thing. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, did I talk about vitamin D synthesis? I think I did. Um, I'll talk about more of that when we get into skin types as well, which is next. Yeah, I think I talked about everything else. Okay. Um, okay, so the hypodermis, also known as the subcutaneous tissue, what made me think of my notes is that um, I learned this a, a long time ago of why it was named subcutaneous. Where did that name come from? And if you take out sub and you look at just cutaneous tissue, which could also be the dermal layers, the dermis, cutaneous. And that's what it meant was just cutaneous, it was the dermis. And it meant that if you cut yourself, that you would bleed. So remember, if you cut yourself and you don't bleed, you've only reached the epidermis. You cut yourself and bleed, you get into vascular, that's in the dermis. So that was cut cutaneous. And then sub, meaning, it's the, the sub of just like hypodermis below. Um, I just thought that was kind of cool when I learned that. Okay. Um, has, okay, so the hypodermis has more adipose than the dermis, a lot more. Um, adipose is fat, and um, adipose or fat is an anatomical term for loose connective tissue composed of adipocytes. Its main role is to store energy in the form of fat, although it also cushions and insulates the body. So that subcutaneous isn't the worst thing in the world, even though we want to shrink it down when we have too much of it. It does very, very great things for us. So it's going to create insulation of our body temperature. It's going to cushion us for different falls, like when I did on my roller skates, when a dog ran in between my legs two days ago. Um... Uh, I'm either roller skating or playing tennis in the evenings. Um, and a collie who loves anything on wheels, this collie, I learned this because his owner told me as I was laying on the ground intertwined with the dog, this collie, when he sees a skateboarder, a rollerblader, a roller skater goes crazy and he just loves to run and chase them. Um, so I was at the park skating and uh, roller skating and this collie starts like barking like crazy and is super excited and um, I was gonna say hi to it so she let it off its leash like let it go a bit 
and it took off running and ran right in between my legs and I was able to stay up and then it turned around and came right between my legs backwards and I was like Whoa. And, I, and we fell on top of one another we were I was intertwined in its dog leash it was quite comical but I'm glad that I had this adipose tissue so um so I had that cushion with my fall um, and then also of course it stores energy right uh, highly vascular, it contains larger blood vessels and nerves than those found in the dermis. So our vascular system is much larger in the deeper part of our body, and then it starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller as it reaches the papillary dermis, they're teeny tiny little capillaries. So the blood vessels are going to be much uh, larger within the fat layer. Hair follicle root is found in the hypodermis. A lot of people... Um, don't know that, but it act, the, the actual root of the hair follicle is um, right at the top of the hypodermis. It almost looks like the reticular dermis, uh, which is great because we need a lot of blood um, supply to the root of the hair follicle to produce the um, the hair follicle. It eventually dies very quickly as it moves up towards the epidermis. But, you know, it's alive in the hypodermis with all of that um, vascularization. Uh, collagen elastin fibers attaching it to the dermis. So that's how it's actually attached. And you can see it right here, um, those collagen elastin uh, fibers that are attaching it. And a net network of septae keeps the fat in place while providing support to the structure. This collagen is um, just like the collagen found in the dermis. So remember that photo that I was talking about with female and male, that this is, this really looks like a female uh, subcutaneous because it's not as dense, right? And it's not as irregular. So these fat cells, when they grow, they start to push from below and we start to get a dimpling effect. But additionally, the septae start to become really rigid and that um, rigidity is creating a pull from below and and that's creating an issue too so we get a push and a pull from really tight rigid um, septae and we get this bumpiness on the top of our um, skin typically like on our legs and arms and abdomen um, where males they're it's really regular and really dense and really amazing and it's really hard for them to get um, any type of cellulite, which is unfortunate for us. All right. So again, I'm going to talk about more on a different webinar, the lymphatic system and, you know, how that's working with treatments. I'm going to talk about um, more of the vascular system and how that's working with treatments. And I'll, I'll put those two together, actually. I'll do the vascular and the lymphatic system together. Um, that's going to be important for, like, uh, cellulite treatments, contouring treatments, um, uh, really any treatment because micro blood circulation is going to be important for all of them because that's where we get the best results. Um, you know, if you guys have the NDAG laser and you're treating leg veins, um, it will be really good to know. So I'll, I'll create one of those webinars. Okay, so skin and aging and what's happening. So our melanocytes in volume go down, but in size go up. And what that creates are brown spots, age spots, the solar lentigo that we are trying to get rid of. Blood vessel, the volume goes down, and that's an issue because slower recovery from trauma. So, you know, healing is, is a lot slower. Um, but additionally, when we have, when those blood vessels go down in volume, we don't have as much oxygen and nutrients to our tissue. So that's going to be um, really a problem as well with aging. Collagen production really goes down. Um, so we have that loss of plumpness to the skin, elasticity, the strength, really the thickness of the skin. Um, cellular, cellular life cycle goes up and cellular turnover goes down. So what happens there is, and that's why you guys, it's, it's so great to do things like microdermabrasion and IPL skin rejuvenation treatments because um, we're removing the dead skin cells so the cellular turnover can, can improve. And then the IPL skin rejuvenation 
also helps improve the um, cellular turnover. So that's where we get like the glow to the skin. Not only is the IPL removing the sunspots that we don't like, but it's also helping improve the cellular um, cell turnover and um, in combination with microdermabrasion that really helps with just like vibrant skin and texture and additionally tone. Collagen and elastin weakens. We know that. We have sagging skin. Um, the GAGs go down, so we have the loss of moisture in the skin. So that's why a lot of practices um, use those hyaluronic acid uh, fillers to plump the skin. And um, collagen goes down, slower healing time. We spoke about that. A lot of bad things. <laughs> um, okay, so the aging impact. So this is going to break it down in general, and then really what we are to expect with aging in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So in general, skin is not immune to gravity, of course. Collagen elastin production slows down 65% between the ages of 20 and 80. Skin thickness decreases 6% every 10 years. 90% oh, of the visible signs of aging are due to sun exposure. I cannot stress that enough. When you talk to your clients in consultations, when I talk to my friends and family, I am always lecturing them on this, especially I have a girlfriend who has the most beautiful skin. It feels like a baby. It's so thick. It's so um, taut. She loves to bathe in the sun. She's a skin type three. So, you know, she's not like me at two. So she has a bit more protection, but she's always tanning. And I always tell her, listen, you're 37 right now. When you're 60, you are going to be so sad that you did this because 90% of the visible signs of aging are due to sun exposure. Oof. So remember that in a consultation and the importance of when you carry a skincare line, having a really good SPF. So they're, they're walking out with that SPF from your office after they purchase a series of treatments, because we know IPL and laser makes the skin more sensitive to the sun. So they're going to need to wear it anyways. But additionally, when you're doing radio frequency treatments and you're trying to strengthen that collagen elastin and they're not wearing sunscreen and the sun is just beating down on them and destroying their collagen elastin, you're never going to get anywhere. So it's so important to, to talk to them about that in consultations. Okay, in our 20s, typically this is when first wrinkles appear around the eyes. They may not be really um, something that bothers people because they're so tiny, but that's when they start to appear. In our 30s, skin becomes less resilient as elastin declines, allowing gravity to begin to have its way. In our 40s, as elasticity begins to diminish, skin loses, loses its memory and becomes less able to snap back. Repetitive movements such as frowning, squinting, or cigarette smoking um, form the first permanent wrinkles. The fifth, in our 50s, normal aging changes become more apparent and gravity is a factor. Gravity works with the decrease in collagen elastin to cause skin and muscles to sag. Gravity also causes the tip of the nose to droop and the ears to elongate. Isn't that crazy? I kind of want my nose to start to droop though because <laughs> that sounds weird, but I have a really long philtrum, the space, this is the philtrum, the space between the nose and the tip of the lip and I've always hated that. So I wouldn't mind my tip drooping a bit, However, I don't want my ears to elongate. And I actually had a procedure um, because I already had um, really long lobes. And I started to notice that they were getting longer now that I'm hitting 40. So I actually had a procedure where they cut them and they made them a bit smaller. So because I look at my mom's and she's in her 60s and they're much longer than mine and we have the same earlobe. So I'm like, oh, I'll just get them cut now. So when they, when I age, they won't get as saggy. So that being said, you can also do that with the VST. Um, by the way, when my mom saw my ears, she's like, oh, I want to get it done. Um, but you can do that with the VST too, is tighten the earlobes because there's collagen, you know, remember everywhere in our body. Um, that's why we're able to do the lip treatment um, to plump naturally, but it will help to tighten earlobes as well when they start to elongate. I just didn't have the time because I was always traveling, so I just chopped them off. 
Uh, 60s, slower healing time. So remember with the VSP and when you're doing like refit treatments, which is targeting um, tightening of the skin, remember older than 60, we space it out longer, the treatments. It's every three to four weeks instead of every two weeks for tightening of the skin because it's a slower healing time. You need to give that time for healing and collagen elastin to actually start to do its, its thing Give, the, give time for those fibroblast cells to get in there and start to produce. Um, and if you don't, you're just creating an injury after an injury, and you don't want to do that. And in the 70s, there is increased thinning of the skin and loss of collagen in the dermis for the wrinkles, lines, and sagging up here. Not long. Okay, uh, general skin care. So I added this just to um, kind of talk about like what the different hand pieces can do for the skin. So cleanse morning and night, deeply clean pores and take off excess oil and debris such as makeup, of course. Um, exfoliate, so um, uh, deeply clean blocked pores and remove oil and dead skin cells. So a way of doing this is microdermabrasions or if you guys, Clarisonic if they have it at home, but um, if you guys do peels in your office, you know, that can be something that they do um, twice a year, like something like a Jesner peel that's, you know, not super strong. They'll get, you know, a little flaky. Um, I try to do a peel uh, once or twice a year just makes the skin look, um, you know, so beautiful after and, and fresh. Um, I prefer microdermabrasion because peels, it kind of sucks your skin, kind of hurts after, and it's not fun going through the process. Microdermabrasion doesn't hurt, um, and it makes the skin really beautiful, and you can do it monthly, which is great because remember, those skin cells are turning over every 28 to 30 days anyways, so you're just really removing, as they're turning over, you're just removing those outermost layer of, the outermost layers of dead skin cells to make the skin look really um, fresh. And also help products penetrate into the tissue too. Additionally, um, light-based treatments and RF treatments. So this can be something that they do every month. Like if you guys do a monthly program at your office, add microdermabrasion in because it's great. Um, tighten. So how do we tighten? We need to enhance collagen production. What does that? RF. Um, it really precisely goes into the papillary and reticular dermis to, to stimulate collagen. IPL. Oh, I just blew my circuit. Hold on one second. Okay, um, so um, IPL can additionally give some tightening because there's some diffuse heat that goes down into the collagen layers. Um, but I would say if somebody was coming in with true loose lax skin, you know, jowls and heavy lids and, you know, a lot of laxity, I wouldn't go for your IPL handpiece for that. I would go for um, your RF handpieces for that. Um, but if someone starts like in their 30s to keep their collagen strong, then the IPL skin rejuvenation treatment is great because you do have some of that diffuse heat down into the collagen. Um, same with the Indiag laser. It, um, it additionally does the same thing. Uh, and then retinoids. I, I kind of more so think of retinoids more as like an exfoliant um, because that's what it does. It exfoliates the surface of the skin. Uh, so I actually should just move that up there. Okay, so tone. Erase the signs of photoaging and eliminating hyperpigmentation and brightening the overall appearance by suppressing the melanocytes. So um, your the IPL and NTYAG help so much with tone. Um, you know, those melanocytes that are producing very large, dark granules because you have... Um, you have uh, um, compromised them with sun exposure, so it's able to help suppress them for not for really not to produce those really large granules, but additionally removing the dark spots that are already on their skin, so it just gives them a beautiful tone. Um, hydroquinone, uh, kojic acid, things, uh, melanin inhibitors can also help with that, and that's very important to have them on those topical products when you're doing some something like melasma, which is very hormonal, and 
backfires with light too, but that's on a whole other webinar that I did. Um, hydrate daily with a moisturizer that helps heal, helps heal the skin and boost the skin's ability to retain moisture. It's so important that our skin is always moisturized to re re retain that moisture because it's going to keep us young, um, just like sebum um, does for our skin. So things like hyaluronic acid, uh, vitamin C serums is great. Uh, not collagen serums because collagen proteins are too large to be pushed down into the dermis. But things like hyaluronic acid and vitamin C are great. And then protect, 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 protect. That is so, that probably the most important um, when you're thinking of things that they're doing at home. So you want them to cleanse their skin daily, for sure. You want them to moisturize, for sure. But you want to drill it into their heads that sunscreen is so important. And, you know, um, I feel like women are really good at that, you know, listening and wearing it. But men can sometimes like, yeah, you know, they're not used to putting moisturizers on their skin every morning. Uh, so I would change their routine. You brush your teeth, you comb your hair, and then you put your sunscreen on as it was moisturizer. It takes one second and it will um, protect their skin and not um, create premature aging because men don't want to prematurely age either. So if they really know this, the importance of it, a lot of men just don't know that sun is 90% uh, of why, we're, why we have aging. I have a few questions here. Um, not all peels are created equally. Um, lo <laughs> love and Byron, cool peels. Oh, I don't know that one. Um, doesn't harm the epidermis. The above is from Heather Lamelon. <laughs> better with a physical block over. Better with a physical block over chemical. Wh what do you mean um, by that, Heather? Better with a physical block over chemical. For SPF. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And and also, if if you're going to carry a skincare line, you're looking into one, you don't have one yet. Um, also, look into their SPF. Is it broadband spectrum? Is it is it covering UVA and UVB? Uh, you you want that uh, full coverage for the skin. And and she's right. If you do not carry peels within your office and you want to start carrying them, not every peel is created equal by no means, just like not every skincare line is created equal by no means. So um, really depends on like really what you're wanting um, to carry, you know, deeper peels, lighter peels, um, minimal peels, things like that. Um, oh, and then lots of zinc. Yeah. And, and that's really good sunscreens will have a lot of zinc because zinc really protects the skin from the sun for sure. All right, so we're almost done. Let me see how long it will be. Oh, yeah, two, I think it'll be two hours. Okay. Um, if I would have kept the rest of the slides, it would have been four. Oh, my. Okay, so the next thing we're going to go into. Sorry, I'm just checking something really quick. One second. Sorry, you guys, I didn't give you, a, I usually give you guys a bathroom break um, after an hour. I did not do that. I was on a roll. So I have one more in the chat. Oh, yeah, zinc. She, she put it acts like a um, reflector. Um, yes, it's really good, really great. Okay, I love this map because I talk about this a lot and um, I never had a map to show it. So I, I'm, I love this one. So skin color results from a combination of genetic, environmental, um, uh, physiological factors. Genetic differences in skin color result from differing amounts of melanin and the size of the melanin granules. So we talked about that, but why? Why do we have different uh, pigment within within all of us. In the U.S., we are a melting pot. We know that. We came from all over the world, and, and it's a big melting pot here. When you go to Africa, it's not as much of a melting pot. When you go to Norway, it's not much of a melting pot at all. So, um, so this is a good example of 
why do we have a lot of pigmented people in Africa and not a lot of pigmented people in Norway? And the equator, if you just draw the equator right here in the middle, you'll understand why. Where we originated, the indigenous skin colors, where did we originate from? So if we were not moving all over the place and creating melting pots in the U.S., for example, or Canada, um, it would be because of the amount of sun exposure our skin would naturally have of where we originated from. So, of course, Africa being very dry and hot and right on the equator right here, um, they need a ton of protection from the sun, right? But when you move up to, to places like Norway and Sweden and um, high up in Russia, Russia, um, Alaska, these places that are very far from the equator, not a lot of sun exposure, right? Because it's cold. Um, a lot of these areas are rainy, cloudy, and um, they don't need as much protection of the sun. Now, they do need to synthesize vitamin D, though. So it's good that they don't have a ton of protection so they can synthesize that vitamin D that they are getting from a bit of sun exposure. Um, Australia is now a melting pot where, you know, back, way back, it wasn't. Um, so, you know, they needed a lot of sun protection as well. So I love this map. Just kind of, uh, you know, explains why, why we have these different skin colors. Okay, so uh, Fitzpatrick skin type definition. I, I love adding actors and actresses, people you would know. Um, so type one always burns, never tans, like Nicole Kidman. We're never going to see her with a tan. Um, she has some type of pigment, but not a lot. Uh, pale skin, typically light eyes and light hair. Type two, myself, Kate Hudson, normally burns, sometimes tans. And, and when you're going through the Fitzpatrick quiz with somebody at your consultation, making sure, always have them take a Fitzpatrick quiz and never guess their skin type. As you're going through it with them, um, they may not understand, like I may think, oh, I tan beautifully. Uh, you know, I've been playing tennis on the weekends and my arms are tan. Like, yeah, I tan really well. I'm a skin type three or four, I may think. But if you ask me a question of like, if you went to Mexico somewhere hot and you were on the beach all day with no sunscreen, what would happen? And that's a huge difference in really what skin type you are. Then, you know, five months later when those melanocytes have produced so many melanosomes and you do actually have a tan compared to in the very beginning before that, um, the, the, um, ah, melanocytes have fully synthesized and gone through its process, right? So make sure you're, you're really asking them those questions. So skin type two, normally burns, sometimes tans, fair skin, light eyes. I have green eyes. Um, type three, sometimes burns, always tans, darker white skin. Somebody like Sandra Bullock, um, like a Mediterranean skin is a lot of times skin type three. Skin type four, burns minimally, tans easily, light brown skin. Asian skin, I typically always think of as skin type four in the beginning. And then if you get to know their skin and then there are more of a skin type three, that's fine. But if you're using like IPL or laser on them, just type them as a skin type four in the beginning because it's just safer. Um, they can be very tricky and they may look fair um, and they may be a skin type four. So just be careful with that. Um, also Hispanic skin typically falls into uh, skin type four. Skin type five, Indian skin or Caucasian skin that's maybe lighter or Caucasian um, that's mixed with African, let's say. Um, a lot of times it's a skin type five. Rarely burns, easily tans darkly and brown skin. And then skin type six, um, your, your darker or darkest uh, skin. A lot of um, African is skin type six. Uh, a lot of Jamaican is skin type six, never burns. They can sometimes, but it's usually never. Always tans darkly, dark brown or black skin. So the next slides um, are, are these actresses. So um, everything that I just went through here, um, highly sensitive skin, um, a lot of times red hair, um, a lot of times blue or green eyes um, or blonde hair. Skin type two. Here's some actresses as a comparison. And myself, a lot of times green or blue eyes too. Skin type three. 
few examples there. Typically brown eyes. They can, they can have lighter eyes though, for sure. Skin type four, Asian skin, Hispanic skin. Skin type five, lighter, lighter black skin or um, black skin mixed with Caucasian or white skin. So African and Caucasian or, you know, black skin and white skin mixed can a lot of times um, be a skin type five. Um, I would actually treat her as a skin type four. I didn't make this part of the PowerPoint. I would have switched that around. <laughs> oh, Indian skin. Indian skin, I, I always set them as a skin type five. In the beginning, they may be a skin type four, but in the beginning when I first start treating them, because the energy is going to automatically set lower for your light-based treatments, um, I just choose a higher um, skin type so the energy will be lower. And then skin type six here. So you can see like when you look at um, Lapita, what's her name, Lapita Nuanga? I, Lapita, I'm not saying that right, but when you look at her or Tyra Banks, compared to Beyonce, there's a difference there. I would still treat Beyonce as a skin type six in the beginning, just for safety. All right, now I'll do questions. All right, let's see. Um, Q and A in the reef. Oh, okay. So Q and A in the refit protocol. It says ten minutes in mode two. No. Um. So the refit that. So you have them. Um, you have two protocols written in there. Um, Jade. So refit is staying in mode four the whole time. And that's because one third of the energy is going to all three depths. So you're getting a ton of skin tightening. So yeah, I'm, I'm oh, thinking hi. Relift, I'm thinking relift, I guess. The one under the neck that you go through all the modes. And I don't know if I wrote it, but oh, okay. that you do under the neck, that's eight weeks and it's some V form and some ST. Okay. Yeah. 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 Relift, relift. Yep. 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 You're right. Um, so relift is doing contouring week one, doing contouring week two, and then ST. Um, so your question is, it says 10 minutes in mode two. It actually is not mode two. So you would do 10 minutes in mode one, your deepest depth, because you're contouring the area. So in your deepest depth, shrinking the fat cells, then you go to mode two for two minutes, and you go to mode three for two minutes for a little skin tightening at the end. So your question is the mode one for 10 minutes. Um, it says 10 minutes, maybe with 10 minute side, five minutes each side, or are you trying to do one side at a time so you can keep the heat going? Okay, so if you're doing like a lower face, right, contouring, um, typically you're always splitting it in half to keep the heat. You can't do five minutes and five minutes because the biology behind um, stimulating lipolysis, it takes 10 minutes at that temperature between 39 to 42 degrees Celsius to actually create lipolysis. So if you do it for five minutes, you didn't do anything. So if you're trying to keep that heat continuous the whole time, you would do the full protocol on the left side, full protocol on the right side. Um, if you can keep heat on both sides at the same time, then that's okay. A lot of times you can't move that fast though, so you would just wanna split, do left side, split, do right side. Did that make sense? Yeah, and sorry, I, the, I got the protocols all mixed up. But oh, no worries, no worries, that, 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 that happens in the beginning for sure, but we figured it out. <laughs> yeah, so, but that would be the point that all the minutes that it says of each of the modes means one side, and then you would go <laughs> over Exactly. Like how long does it take you to do a whole face? I'll do well, it all four modes. It would be about 30 minutes because your preheat is pretty fast because it's the face. And then, you, then the protocol is 14 minutes, 10 minutes in mode one, two minutes in mode two, two minutes in mode three. So it's 14 minutes total. So that's about 15 to 16 minutes per side. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait till you come join us. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> did, did you, Jade, did you, um, that was you, right, Jade? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did did you you just purchase your system, correct? Right. 
And have you signed up for your training yet? Well, we're in the quarantine. You're Sorry. still shut down. Okay, okay. Just wanted to check. We're hoping soon. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Okay, I just wanted to check to make sure that you weren't, um, you know, waiting. And, and uh, it's such a bummer. This quarantine sounds like it's going to happen again for a lot of states. Oh, such a bummer. Uh, Cynthia, perfect review of skincare. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Cynthia. So happy you were on, and I'm so happy, happy it was helpful. Um, I hope it, I hope it was helpful for you guys. Um, I think when you really understand the skin and I hope I, I did it, uh, I gave it justice. Um, cause it's not something that I typically talk about, right? I'm typically just talking about the devices. So it's, um, it, it's in my wheelhouse, but kind of out of my wheelhouse and in, in terms of speaking on it, cause that doesn't always happen. Um, but when you really understand the skin, then you really understand your system. And that's the most important thing. And when you really understand your skin and really understand your system, your consultations are going to be amazing um, because you know what to offer them. You know what they need. You know that, you know, RF is going to go deep to stimulate collagen where the IPL can help those keratinocytes regenerate. Um, and those two combined can give just a beautiful result. You know that microdermabrasion is going to remove those dead skin cells. So you have amazing penetration of everything you're doing. So, um, so yeah, I think that that uh, you know really understanding it is is going to be helpful for sure. Oh, thank you, Jade. Always helpful. Thank you. Um, when answering the Fitzpatrick quiz, we are asking for the beginning of summer before melanosomes are active. Yes. So just their plain skin type, like if they had never been in the sun. And, and the questionnaire should ask that. What is your natural hair color? What is your natural eye color? Um, how would you respond in the sun? You know, it, it should be worded in a way that they would know. Um, but of course, just reviewing it quickly before they take the quiz is going to be helpful. And it would be before summer, before any active, um, uh, any active melanosomes and melanocytes, uh, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining. Just gonna hang out a bit just to see if there's any additional questions. You guys are quiet. I didn't think you guys would be on this one. It's so funny. The ones that I feel like are going to be the most active in a lot of questions are usually the ones that are not, which I guess is good. Kind of covered everything. <laughs> oh, I wanted to remind you guys before you get off. Um, Cocktails with Kara is coming back today. So, um, so we're doing it today at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. And we have a special guest. Her name is Crystal. She's the owner of Bio2 Med Spa in Arizona. And she opened back up a few weeks ago. And we're going to talk about, she's a very successful med spa in Phoenix. So we wanted to hear from her and, and her success and how she has so many patients that wanted to get back to her. So how she reopened, um, what she did in terms of safety, what she did that, that really worked and what she did that maybe did not work and she would have done it differently. So I think that's going to be great to hear from her. Um, and, and kind of a trial and error before you guys open back up, just in case you guys haven't yet. Um, so that, that is on Instagram Live, um, and it's, it will be on Viora Med. So just look out for Viora Med at that time, popping on live on Instagram. All right, I have something else in the chat here. Yay, yay, Cynthia, you're gonna be on, I know it. <laughs> All right. Well, it's quiet, so we'll sign off. Um, by the way, um, since things are kind of reopening again, um, you know, when I first started the webinars, I was doing them twice a week. 
Then we move down to once a week. So now we're moving into um, once every other week. So next Friday, there won't be one. It's kind of sad for me um, just because I love being here with you guys. I look forward to it every week. Um, but we're going to do every other. So this coming Friday, there will not be one the next Friday. There will be. Um, it's going to be for reaction customers. So if you guys do not own the reaction, then you don't, you, you don't need to, to be on it. <laughs> um, and then we, oh, no, 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 no. No, I'm sorry. Never mind. Not next week, but the week after. It's going to be on memberships and loyalty programs. So for sure be on that one, um, everybody. So we'll go through different, and I have a new membership to talk about, so we'll talk about different memberships. Um, I hope to have another loyalty program to talk about for you guys, so that will be in two weeks. So hope that all of you guys are on that one. Okay, hold on, I got a few more in the chat. Um, what's the cocktail today? I actually haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> I gotta figure it out. Uh, thanks for everything once again. Oh my gosh, of course, Hillary. Thank you for always um, joining. Thanks, Kara. You're welcome, Janelle. Um, so one more. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. We'll see you later on Cocktails with Kara. Um, uh, Susan, you raised your hand. Um, let me see if I can, I'll try to unmute you here. Oh, maybe put your hand down. Oh, she, you just wrote in. Thanks again for a great meeting. You're welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for joining. All right, you guys. Okay, so have a great weekend. Um, stay safe. You know, I thought that I wouldn't have to say that as much anymore, but sounds like it's coming on back. So stay safe, but enjoy yourselves. Have a great weekend. And um, I'll see you hopefully all on Cocktails with Kara in a couple hours. Fiona, thank you so much for this informative session. You're so welcome, and thank you for joining. Okay, bye, you guys.